All right. So introduction to the immune response and inflammation. So we're gonna talk about our body's defenses, how we fight off infections. We're gonna talk about our barrier defenses. We're gonna talk about cellular defenses, the inflammatory response in the body, and then the immune response in the body. So our barrier defenses, we have our skin, We have our skin, our mucous membranes, our gastric acid, and then that major histocompatibility complex. So our body is equipped with different um, anatomical barriers that essentially are just designed to prevent foreign pathogens from entering and they serve as a line of defense to protect our body so that nothing happens to it. Um, our skin is the first line of defense. Okay, this is important information. Skin is the first line of defense. It protects all of our internal organs and our tissues. Um, our skin does have certain glands that can secrete chemicals that are able to destroy and repel um, many different pathogens. The top layer of our skin does fall off daily, which makes it very difficult for pathogens to colonize on the skin. And then we have a normal flora, abnormal bacterial flora on our skin, which helps to also destroy all those disease causing pathogens. So our mucous membranes, these are lined areas of the body that are exposed to different external um, influences that they don't offer the same protection as the skin. Um, but we have our respiratory tract, which is exposed to air. We have the GI tract, which is disposed to anything that we take in through our mouth. And then we have our genotorinary tract, our GU tract, which is exposed to pathogens from the perineal area and the rectal area. And then we have our gastric acid. So the stomach goes and secretes acid in response to many different things that happen in the body. Um, the acid of the stomach of course, we know it aids in digestion, but it also destroys many pathogens that are ingested or swallowed um, after they're removed from the respiratory tract. And then the major histocompatibility complex, this is what we call the body's last barrier of defense. And basically it's the ability to be able to distinguish between self cells and foreign cells. So the self cells are things that are supposed to be in our body that our body recognizes as their own. Um, so back in taking it back to um, biology, you remember that um, all of our cells and all of our tissues from each person are marked for identification as part of that like genetic code. So no two people have the same code. Um, in humans, our genetic code is carried on by chromosomes. Um, and it's called, that's what's called the major, major histocompatibility complex. This complex produces proteins. Um, they call them histocompatibility antigens, or you also know them as human leukocyte antigens, HLAs. These antigens are actually proteins. There, you're going to find them on that actual membrane of the cell, and then they allow the body to be able to recognize as um, foreign and self cells. They actually give off like a little signal so that when, um, the body will say, hey, I belong in the body, or hey, I don't belong here, I'm foreign, and something needs to target that and get rid of it. So our types of cellular defenses, um, we have the mononuclear phagocyte system, which is composed of our thymus gland, our lymphatic tissue, our leukocytes, our lymphocytes, and then there's a whole bunch of different chemical mediators. So if or when a foreign pathogen does happen to get past that barrier defense that we talked about in the previous slide, then they're gonna come in contact with these human inflammatory and immune systems or this MPS system, the mononuclear phagocyte system. And that's gonna spring into action and try to um, get rid of it. So we have different stem cells that are located in our bone marrow. They are responsible for producing two types of white blood cells, or you can also call leukocytes, and that they're gonna produce the lymphocytes and the myelocytes. Um, this is also a refresher from biology. The lymphocytes, that's gonna be your T cells, your B cells, and your natural killer cells. 
um, the myelocytes, they can actually develop into a number of different cells um, that are important for that inflammatory response in the body and that immune response. The myelocytes include your neutrophils, your basophils, your eosinophils, and your monocytes or macrophages. Um, when you guys are thinking of infection and immune response in your patients, and you say you did a CBC on your patient, which, um, what lab values do you think, which one of these that we just talked about, your neutrophils, your basophils, your eosinophils, or your monocytes, which ones would be the first ones to um, become elevated, do you think, in the body and show up in your labs? The monocytes. Yes. Usually it's the neutrophils. So the other ones will show too, but not as quick as the neutrophils will. So if you're doing a CBC with a differential um, where it lists all the different white blood cells, usually it's your neutrophils that are going to show up first, but you will see a small increase in those bas basophils and your eosinophils. This is important information for you guys to know. Okay, you're gonna see it again. All right, our lymphoid tissues. All right, so the lymph nodes and the lymphoid tissue, what they do is they store different concentrated amounts of those neutrophils, those basophils, the eosinophils, and the lymphocytes. And they help um, facilitate that um, destruction process that, harp, that happens with those, um, when the body's trying to get rid of those foreign proteins. Your spleen, um, which is a very small organ that's located up under your, nef your left rib cage, um, it contains um, white blood cells also that help destroy bacteria and help your body fight infections. So we have so many different defense systems. Um, our bone marrow also has a role in helping to differentiate those different cellular components in that um, MPS system that we talked back a couple slides back. And then we said that thymus gland also is responsible um, for that final differentiation of the T cells and regulating the actions in the immune system. Lymphoid tissues um, play a part in those cellular defense systems. Um, that, so it's the lymph nodes, the spleen, the thymus gland, they're all part of that tissue. Um, and then your bone marrow also. So our inflammatory response. This is an important slide for you guys to know. So when there is cellular injury, once that injury occurs to the cell, it causes an activation of certain chemicals in the plasma called that Hagman factor. When that Hagman factor is activated, it's gonna start an inflammatory response in the body, okay? That happens as soon as there's injury to the cells. When the Hagman factor starts that um, inflammatory response, it activates at least three different systems in the body. Um, you have your kinin system, which is um, a substance that is, um, which, what is the Hagen, the Kenan system causes the precursor substance of Kenogen to be converted into Bradykin and other Kenans, and these help fight off infection. I don't expect you to know that. Um, I'm just giving you a little background. Um, so the Hagman factor activates the Kenan system, the clotting cascade in your body, which initiates blood um, clotting, and then the plasmogenogen system, which helps um, that helps actually dissolve blood clots in the body. Your bradykinin that um, causes local vasodilation and creates changes in your capillary permeability, which causes more blood to come to that injured area. So whenever there's an injury, um, that bradykinogen comes out, you have that vasodilation, and then it, all that blood comes to that injured area and it allows the white blood cells to escape into the tissues. Um, it also stimulates certain nerve endings in the body to cause pain. Um, and you want that to happen because that's going to alert you that there's something, there's some kind of an injury going on in the body. So that is important to, we want that process to happen. The bradykinins also cause the release of um, um, certain acids, which um, 
come out of the cell membrane and they act like um, local hormones and they cause an effect in the immediate area when they are broken down and they help in that healing process. So this is just a slide. You have this actually in your book. You can look at this. This just shows you exactly how the, um, I can make this bigger for you guys. How this happens. So you have your tissue injury and then it shows the release of the histamine. Once that histamine comes down, it's gonna cause that ca um, capillary perme um, permeability, that vasodilation, it's gonna get all that blood flow to the area. When you get that blood flow to the area, you're gonna have that warmth. So we said, what are the signs of infection? Swelling, redness, heat. This is all caused by this inflammatory response, this release of that histamine. Um, you're gonna have that capillary permeability. We said that's gonna cause vasodilation. All those plasma proteins are gonna expel into that area. That's gonna cause that edema. So these are your redness, your heat, and your swelling. And then this process over here, a little bit more complicated. I'm not gonna read through all of that. There's a couple different processes. Um, but at the end of that process, you get the pain. And then finally, through all these processes, the removal of that um, infection, the um, bacteria, whatever happened, and then it prepares the site for healing. So it's a pretty complex um, response system. So we talked about that histamine release. When an injury occurs to the cell, it causes that local release of histamines, um, creating that vasodilation, bringing more of that blood and the blood components to the area alters that um, capillary permeability, lets those neutrophils and those blood chemicals to leave the bloodstream and enter the injured area. Um, this is an important slide. You guys need to know this. When histamines are released, it also not only does it um, cause that vasodilation, it also stimulates the pain perception. Okay, so vasodilation, dilation, bringing more blood and those blood components to the area and stimulating pain perception. It's gonna help engulf and get rid of the invader and remove the cell that has been injured so that the body can start to heal. Chemotaxis, this is the ability to attract neutrophils. Um, and stimulate them and other macrophages in the area to be very aggressive to start the healing process. Once activated, the neutrophils and the other chemicals are released into that damaged area of the body and they destruct the cell and cause injury. When destroyed, the cell releases different lysosomal enzymes. They in turn dissolve and destroy that cell membrane and all those cellular proteins. When you have that inflammatory reaction, the enzymes cause a local cellular breakdown, which causes a little bit more further inflammation, and then it develops into that um, cycle, which eventually leads to cell death. Whoops. So our clinical presentation, what are we gonna see? Once these inflammatory responses are active in the body, it's gonna produce these characteristic clinical picture that the nurse is gonna be able to see. So you're gonna have your caler, that is heat. That's caused by that vasodilation. We're increasing the cell permeability and getting that blood flow to that injured site. You have the, um, they say tumor or swelling that's caused by the fluid that leaks into the tissues. You have the ruber, or you also call redness, and related, um, also again, related to that increase in blood flow caused by the vasodilation. And then you have dolor, which is pain. So that comes from the activation of those pain fibers caused by the histamine and the kinin system. Um, these signs and symptoms will occur anytime a cell is injured in the body. So our immune response is a little more specific type of an invasion in our body that can stimulate a very specific response through our immune system. We have stem cells in our bone marrow, which produce lymphocytes. They are capable of developing into those T lymphocytes and those B lymphocytes. There are other um, 
certain lymphocytes, including those natural killer cells that we talked about, and those lymphokine activated killer cells, both of those are considered very aggressive um, against neoplastic or cancer cells, and they promote rapid cellular death. So what are the types of uh, T cells that we have? So we have regular, our T cells are programmed, they come from the thymus gland and they, they have what is called a cell mediated immunity. In chapter 15, you can look at figure 15.3, it goes into a little bit more detail about that. And then your T cells can be broken down into three different sites. So you have the effect effector or the cytotoxic T cells. They're, fine. They're found all throughout your body. Um, they are considered very aggressive against non-self cells, so those foreign bodies. Um, they release cytokines or different chemicals that can either cause direct um, destruction of that foreign cell or they can mark it for aggressive destruction by phagocytes. So they'll put a little mark on it, leave a little protein on it, and then those phagocytes will come into the area when that inflammatory response starts and it will um, kill the cell. You have your helper T cells. You can also call them CD4 cells. Um, they respond to the chemical indicators of immunity, of immune activity, and they stimulate other lymphocytes, including B cells, to be aggressive and responsive. So when we talk about these helper T cells um, and the CD4, when you are dealing with patients that have AIDS or HIV, you will see that um, frequent labs will be drawn on them and they will look at their CD4 count. So if they have a low CD4 count, that means that they don't have a good immune system. Um, you have your suppressor T cells, also called CD8 cells. They respond to the rising levels of certain chemicals associated with those immune responses. And what they do is they can suppress or slow the reaction. So they all work in a different way to accomplish the same job. Oops. Uh, so we said, just said this actually, I just didn't turn the slide. I just talked about it on the previous slide. So our B cells, what is the role of the B cells? So they are also programmed to identify certain proteins or antigens in the body. They provide what is called a humoral immunity, also known as antibody mediated immunity. You'll hear those two interchangeable. So humoral immunity or antibody mediated immunity. It is a branch of what we call adaptive immunity, and that works by mediating um, antibodies that are secreted by those B lymphocyte cells, and it works against very specific pathogens outside the cell. So we call anything outside the cell extracellular. So these would be extracellular pathogens. When a B cell does react with a specific antigen, it changes to become a plasma cell. Plasma cells produce antibodies or immunoglobins, which circulate in the body and they react with this specific antigen when it is incurred, encountered. Then you have complement proteins. So complement proteins work in a cascade fashion to form a ring around an antigen or antibody complex. The complement can destroy the antigen by altering the membrane and allowing an osmotic flow of fluid that basically caused the antigen to burst because of that inflow of fluid. We have antibody formation. So the initial formation of antibodies or that primary response that starts when it meets um, a bacteria actually takes several days. Once activated, the B cells form certain memory cells that in turn produce antibodies for the immediate release in the future when that antigen is encountered again. The antibodies will then be released into the system as immunoglobins. Um, the process of antibody form formation is called acquired or active immunity. It is a lifelong reaction. Um, it doesn't, it's not limited. So a good example to this is if a person is exposed to chicken pox, um, they might have a mild respiratory reaction when first exposed to the virus um, varicella after it enters the respiratory tract. There's a two to three week incubation period as the body is forming all those immunoglobin antibodies. 
um, to start that attack against the chicken pox virus when it appears again. Um, the, chicken the chicken pox virus enters the cell and it starts automatically multiplying. Um, the cell eventually will rupture and it ejects more of the virus into the system. When that happens, your body is going to respond with the immediate release of those antibodies. Um, and then you're going to see that full mount, that full antibody mount response in your body. And then you're going to see your fever. You're going to see body aches. You're going to see joint aches. You might even see skin lesions. Um, all of that is in response to, is immune response to that actual virus. Um, once that chickenpox virus has all been destroyed, it goes into your CNS and it hibernates from different antibodies, different antibodies in the um, body, but they always stay there. They can stay in your CNS for many years, dormant. They don't cross the CNS um, and the virus remains unfect, unaffected while it's there. Um, our beast memory cells, they continue to make a supply of the immunoglobin. What they do is they continue to make a supply. They store it for future um, exposure in case they ever see that virus again. It doesn't, they don't get released until they interact with that virus again that they saw previously. And when they do, they're released and they destroy it immediately. Other mediators in the immune response, you have interferons, which are chemicals that are secreted by cells that have been invaded by viruses and other stimuli. They prevent the, vi they prevent the virus from re um, replicating, and they also suppress malignant cell replication and tumor growth. You have your interleukins, which are chemicals that are secreted by those leukocytes. Um, and they influence other leukocytes. They stimulate T and B cells to initiate immune responses in the body. Then you have the TNF, which is the tumor necrosis factor. And that's actually a cytokine. Um, it's a chemical that's released by those macrophages and it inhibits tumor growth and can actually cause the regression of tumors. It also works with other chemicals to make the inflammatory and immune response very efficient and more aggressive. The interrelationship of the immune and the inflammatory responses. So it's important that as nurses, we understand that the immune and the inflammatory responses work together to protect the body and maintain a certain homeostasis um, within the body. Those helper T cells, they stimulate the activity of B cells and effector T cells. The suppressor T cells monitor the chemical activity in the body, and then they act to suppress the B cell and the T cell activity when certain foreign antigens are under control. So if there's nothing going on, then those suppressor T cells keep everything at bay and they don't release anything because there's no need to. The B cells and the T cells ultimately depend on an effective inflammatory reaction to achieve the end goal of destruction of the foreign proteins or cells. So pathophysiology involving the immune system. So there's different conditions um, that can arise when you have problems in your immune system. Um, many of them can be treated by drugs. Um, you want to stimulate or suppress the immune system. That includes your neoplasms, which are your cancers, certain viral invasions, um, autoimmune diseases, and then um, transplant rejections. So your kidneys, livers, things like that. So neoplasms are, um, they happen when you have mutant cells and when those cells escape the normal surveillance of the immune system. So they slip by somehow. They start to grow and then they multiply. Those are your cancers. Then you have your viral invasion of cells. So you have viruses or parasites. They can only survive um, by invading a, a certain cell that gives them um, nourishment and keeps that, and that's what they need for viral replication. So that's the only way they can survive. When they enter the cell, the cell membrane is then altered. This can change and activate cellular immunity, or it can be so subtle that the immune system's response to the cells is actually mild or absent, not even noticed at all. 
In some cases, the response activates a cellular immune reaction to normal cells similar to the one that was invaded. Then you have your autoimmune disease. So this occurs when the body responds to those self antigens. So I told you in a couple of slides back that our body should know and be able to differentiate between our self cells, which we need, and those foreign cells. Well, with autoimmune diseases, they can't tell the difference. So your own body starts um, attacking and destroying your own self, um, your own self cells. And they really don't know what the cause of that is. Um, there's a lot of research on it, but they still don't really have a firm understanding of what causes that to happen. So when you um, take care of patients that have um, transplants, the body doesn't recognize it as something normal. So it's gonna produce an immune reaction in the body and then the body wants to destroy it. So in order to keep that from happening, these patients have to take um, anti-rejection medicine. Um, sometimes for the rest of their life, so the body doesn't try and destroy it and get rid of it because they know that it's not, a, you know, it's not, it, it wasn't born in that body. And they know it's not a self organ because it comes from something else. So anti-inflammatory, we're going to talk about anti-arthritis. So an inflammatory response is designed to protect the body from injury and certain pathogens. Um, it uses chemical mediators to produce a reaction that helps destroy those pathogens and it helps to promote healing. As the body reacts to these chemicals, it's gonna produce those clinical signs and symptoms that we see such as swelling, fever, aches and pains. You have different types of drugs that are used as anti-inflammatory agents. We have corticosteroids. So we, you're gonna see these a lot in the hospital setting. Um, we use these a lot. They are used um, systemically to block inflammatory and immune system reactions. Um, blocking certain um, systems from working is important because um, it's a protective process that can produce certain adverse effects, um, including decreased resistance to infections and neoplasms. Um, corticosteroids um, can cause adverse side effects, but usually the benefits outweigh the risks. Um, next semester, we'll talk more about these and go into more depth. Um, Anti-inflammatory drugs are now actually available over the counter. Um, but there's also a potential that they can abuse them and that you could have an overdose. So patients taking these drugs, um, it, when they take them, it can block signs and symptoms of other illnesses, which can cause a misdiagnosis of a problem. Corticosteroids are also used topically, so you can use them systemically, um, and you can use them um, topically to produce local anti-inflammatory effects without as many adverse effects. So for you, like your skin, issues like redness, itching, rashes, things like that. You have your salicylates. So these are a very popular inflammatory agent. Um, they're, they work very well at blocking the inflammatory response in the body, but they also have a fever blocking and an, an analgesic property to them. So they're antipyretic. So antipyretic means fever blocking. Analgesic means pain blocking. So they decrease that inflammatory response, they reduce fever, and they reduce pain. They are one of the oldest anti-inflammatory drugs around. They're very well known and very well studied and pretty safe. Um, what they do is they inhibit, they work in the body to inhibit the synthesis of the prostaglandin, which is an important mediator in that inflammatory response reaction. They are usually prescribed and indicated for mild or moderate pain, fever, and a variety of different inflammatory conditions, including mostly what we see them for is rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis. They do, like any drug, have adverse side effects um, associated, so it can cause um, effects on the stomach. So you can have dyspepsia, nausea, heartburn, or epigastric discomfort, and it also can affect our clotting system in our body, and it can cause certain bleeding abnormalities and certain blood loss. Not everybody obviously will experience these issues, but these are some 
of the common ones that we see. So you're gonna to wanna to educate your patients about that. So we said earlier they are inhibited. They, this drug works to inhibit that synthesis of the prostaglandin. It's also used to treat mild to moderate pain and fever. It is absorbed in the stomach. It works in five to 30 minutes. It is metabolized in the liver and excreted in the urine. Um, contradictions, you would not wanna give this to your patient if they have a known allergy to any properties in the silly salivates, or if they have any bleeding abnormalities because we said a slide earlier that they can cause bleeding issues. Um, and then of course it is excreted in the urine, right? So we would not wanna give this to our patient who has impaired renal function. And then because it's metabolized in the liver, you're also gonna to wanna to look at their liver enzymes as well and make sure they don't have any issues. And then drug to drug interactions, well, you wouldn't wanna use this drug if it interacts with other drugs that interfere with absorption. So some common um, medications that you may have seen is aspirin. Um, it helps treat inflammatory conditions. We have um, valsalazide, which is a relatively new drug that treats ulcerative colitis. You have choline magnesium trisilisaliate, which is, treats mild pain and fever and arthritis. Um, choline silicylate, which treats mild pain and fever, as well as arthritis, and then mesalamine. Mesalamine I give daily, probably at the hospital. Um, if not daily, then at least once a week when I'm there. And this treats inflammation of the large intestine. We also have osalazine, which is converted to mes mesalamine in the colon, and it has um, anti-inflammatory effects. We have Salsalate, which is used to treat pain, fever, and inflammation, and then Rexalate, which treats episodes of acute gout and muscular pain and rheumatic fever. I've never given any of those meds or heard of those meds, just the mesalamine. Some nursing considerations when we give this medication to our patients, well, we're gonna assess for any contradiction, right? Any history of allergy, um, because we wanna avoid those hypersensitivity reactions. Um, we wanna use cautiously in patients that have renal disease because these drugs are excreted in the urine. Um, patients with bleeding disorders. Um, so chicken pox or influenza in children because you wanna avoid Rye syndrome. Um, if you think your child has chicken pox or influenza, you would not give them aspirin because they can, it can develop into Rye syndrome. So this is the same case because these, um, these have that, you know, they're aspirin um, in these medications. And then anybody who's pregnant or lactating because you don't want to, to have an adverse effect on the fetus or the baby, and you don't want to cause any risk of bleeding in the mother. So you're gonna perform that physical assessment to establish a baseline for your patient when you're starting therapy. And then you're gonna to continue to monitor them for any potential adverse effects. You wanna monitor their pulse rate, their blood pressure and perfusion because this is how we're gonna see if they have any bleeding issues, right? Or any cardiovascular events of the effects of the drug. Your patient's having a problem with bleeding, you're gonna see that in their pulse and their blood pressure. Um, you're gonna to wanna to monitor laboratory tests. You're gonna look at that complete blood count. You're gonna look at those liver and renal functions. Um, you might wanna do a urinalysis. You're gonna be looking for blood in the stool. So you can do a um, culture of their stool. And then you're gonna look at those labs that look at clotting times to determine if there's any um, issues with their, with their bleeding. And then you're gonna to wanna to monitor their temperature to evaluate if they're using it for fever, if the medicine is effective. So some nursing diagnoses that we can use would be acute pain, um, ineffective breathing patterns, um, disturbed sensory perception if, there, if there's any kind of toxicity, um, and then deficient knowledge related to drug therapy because we're gonna to wanna to educate our patients about this medication. 
You want to administer the medication with food if the patient says that they're having um, GI upset or any kind of nausea. You can also tell them to have small frequent meals that will help slow, um, um, alleviate some of those GI effects that you see. You want to make sure you're telling them to take this medication as indicated. Um, monitor again for those severe reactions. Um, have them contact the doctor if they have any issues. Um, make sure you're giving supportive care, rest, control their environment, keep their temperature set if they're hot or cold, um, depending on if they have a fever or not. Monitor their drug response to the drug. So we're gonna look at those relief of signs and symptoms, monitor those vital signs, look at those labs, um, evaluate the effectiveness of your teaching plans, right? Have that patient respond back to you, telling them how long they're gonna take this medication, what the medication is, how they're gonna take it and why they're taking it, for what reason, and what to do if they have any adverse reactions. Um, we also have non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents. So we have um, our propionic acids, that's your phenoprofen and your ibuprofen. Um, something that you should know about these um, NSAIDs is that some of them, there's new studies um, that are linking these drugs to an increased risk of stroke in certain patients and death. Um, so mainly the side effects we've known about these for years is they cause a risk for bleeding in the GI tract. They're hard on the stomach. Well, now there's, you know, it takes a long time to get a study out, um, 10, 15 years before you start seeing concrete evidence that you can really relate to a drug. So now we're have, we have, we've done a lot of research on them and now we are seeing these increased risk of stroke and death as well as these issues with the GI tract. So it's just something to keep in mind. Um, people think that because they're over the counter, they're harmless, um, but you really wanna only take them as needed. And if you can take Tylenol, Tylenol is always a better choice than these, unless you're using it for inflammation reasons. Um, so then you have your acidic acids. So you, you have your um, diclofenac and your italidac. You have your phenomates, which are your methanamic acid. And then you have your, whatever that is, two inhibitors, which is your Celebrex. Um, those are your anti-inflammatory, your um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents. So what do NSAIDs do? They do effectively work with providing anti-inflammatory and analgesic effects in the body. They're sold over the counter, which like I said, it can lead to abuse because they don't think there's any real side effects with them. What these drugs do is they have antipyretic effects and anti-inflammatory and analgesic um, properties to them. And they also work um, in that prostaglandin synthesis and they cause that reaction from occurring. So your NSAIDs actually block um, two enzymes known as COX-1 and COX-2, COX. COX-1 you will find in all of your tissues and it's involved in a lot of different body functions, including blood, um, blood clotting, it helps to protect your stomach lining, and it helps maintain what we call a sodium water balance in your kidney. Your COX-2 is active when you, see, when you have a site of trauma or an injury where all those prostaglandins go, um, but it's not seen in other tissue types. So it's just gonna really be seen at that site of trauma or injury. Um, and they work to interfere with this part of the inflammatory reactions. So NSAIDs block inflammation before all of the signs and symptoms can develop. So what they do, um, it makes sense with the GI bleeds and the GI issues because you see that COX-1 is essential for protecting that stomach lining. Well, if we use an NSAID, it's gonna block those two enzymes, right? That COX-1 enzyme being one of them. So if it blocks that enzyme, you don't have that protection barrier in the stomach anymore, which is why people get ulcers and why they're more subject to bleeding. So I like to tell you, I don't expect you guys to know that. I'm not gonna test you on that, but I want you to know why that um, GI component is so important. 
Your pharmacokinetics, NSAIDs are rapidly absorbed from the GI tract. They reach peak levels in one to three hours. Again, metabolized by the liver and excreted in the urine. NSAIDs cross the placenta and cross into the breast milk. So you want to really educate your patients who are pregnant and breastfeeding. Um, they are not recommended during pregnancy or lactation because they have a lot of um, adverse effects on the fetus and the neonate. And then of course, they, you are, they are contraindicated in um, the pre presence obviously of an allergy um, to any NSAID. Adverse effects, that would be sometimes nausea, dyspepsia, GI pain, constipation, diarrhea, flatulence, all caused because it's blocking that COX-1. They don't have any of uh, protection in that GI lining. There is the potential for <clears throat> GI bleeding. If that happens, you would want to discontinue the drug. Some people may see headache, dizziness, or fatigue. Um, this can happen when those prostaglandins are released in the body and gets into the CNS. Um, they could have bleeding. They could have platelet inhibition. So platelet inhibition is when you can't make platelets. We need platelets to clot our blood. If we can't clot our blood, we will bleed out. So that's one of the problems. It can cause hypertension, which is where now they're thinking that's linked to that, um, that um, risk of having cardiovascular issues and risks of stroke because it can, they think it's causing hypertension that isn't monitored. And then it can even cause bone marrow depression um, with chronic use. And then our drug-to-drug -drug interactions, um, they do say that sometimes there's a decreased diuretic effect when you take NSAIDs with loop diuretics. And there's a potential for decreased antihypertensive effect of certain beta blockers. Your metoprolols, things like that. A metoprolol is a beta blocker. Um, if you combine these medications. And then sometimes if you use ibuprofen and lithium, we'll talk more about that in a couple of weeks. Um, if you take that, it can actually have um, cause lithium toxicity, which can cause your patient to die. It's pretty serious. So acetaminophen, you guys know that. The brand name is Tylenol. We use Tylenol to treat mild pain and fever, often in the place of NSAIDs. Um, it is used most frequently for managing pain and fever in children, and it is obviously just like NSAIDs or your ibuprofens widely available over the counter and is found in different many combinations. And um, acetaminophen acts directly on the thermoregulatory cells that are located in our hypothalamus. They cause sweating and vasodilation. Um, in turn, when that process happens, it causes the release of heat and lowers your fever. Um, the mechanism of action is related to analgesic effects. They don't know how it works, but they know that at, that is one of the effects that it offers. So it helps with fever and pain. Um, this is a type of medicine that you could give your children if they have the flu um, instead of that aspirin because we don't want them to get Rye syndrome. Um, you can use it for musculoskeletal pain associated with arthritis. So this is another medicine that helps your patient with arthritis. So they can go between the NSAIDs and the acetaminophen. So your NSAIDs are very, very, very toxic to your liver. Your acetaminophen can be toxic to, no, acetaminophen is toxic to your liver. NSAIDs are toxic to your kidneys. So you always wanna remember that. Pharmacokinetics, it is absorbed from your GI tract. You are gonna see peak, um, it's gonna be in a half an hour to up to two hours. Again, metabolized in the liver, excreted in the urine. Um, you would not give if you have any known allergy to acetaminophen and you wanna use caution in pregnancy and lactation. Adverse reactions, you might see headaches, hemolytic anemia, some renal dysfunction, you could have a skin rash or a fever. Hepatotoxicity, usually associated with chronic use and overdose. And then oral anticoagulants can increase bleeding when you take this because of the issues, because of the effects that it has on the liver.
nursing considerations, you're going to want to assess for, con assess for contraindications or cautions, any allergies, um, um, pregnancy or lactation, that hepatic or renal disease, um, any cardiovascular dysfunction, hypertension, GI bleeding, or ulcers. You always want to have an established baseline, baseline for your patient before starting therapy, and then educate your patient about any potential adverse effects. So our anti-arthritic arthritis agents. So these are drugs that we use to block the anti-inflammatory the inflammatory response. Um, we call these our anti-arthritis drugs. Arthritis is a debilitating inflammatory response in our joints that causes bone deformities and pain depending on how severe it is. It's different for each person. Um, Anti-arthritis drugs include a um, gold compound, which is called Redora. This medicine is used to prevent and suppress arthritis in certain patients with rheumatoid arthritis. The other anti-arthritis drugs that we use are used specifically to block the inflammation and the tissue damage caused by the rheumatoid arthritis. So one blocks the inflammation, the other one prevents and suppresses the arthritis from actually happening. So they work different ways. So these are our gold compounds. So some patients that we take care of with, with rheumatic inflammatory conditions will not respond to the usual anti-inflammatory therapies that we use and their conditions will get worse even after they've been on um, these pharmacological treatments for months and weeks. It doesn't help. Some of the patients respond to treatment with what we call gold salts, also known as, as chrysotherapy, um, which is gold. This happens when um, gold is taken up by the macrophages in the body. And then in turn, it inhibits phagocytosis. Um, it is reserved for use in patients who are unresponsive for the conventional therapy because it can be very toxic. So this is the chrysotherapy is not the initial treatment that we would give to these patients um, after they have tried other therapies and they don't work after weeks or months, then this will be offered to them and you have to be a candidate for it. Um, the gold salt is available for use as Aranafan or Radara. So your pharmacokinetics, it, um, the absorption is going to vary depending on the site of administration, and it usually is well distributed throughout the body. Gold salts are very toxic and are contraindicated in um, patients that have an allergy to gold, um, your patients that have diabetes, your patients that have um, congestive heart failure, if they have any hepatic impairment because it's hard on the liver, and then if they have hypertension. So if they're looking at hypertension, they're going to look at how long they've had it and how uncontrolled it is. It is possible they could still have it, just depends on how severe um, the hypertension is. Therapeutic actions and indications. Oops. Oops, hold on. All right, so it is indicated to treat certain cases of rheumatic rheumatoid arthritis, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, and in patients who have been unresponsive in that standard therapy. Pharmacokinetics, it is absorbed, we said earlier, at different rates depending on the body. You will see it excreted in urine and feces and it can cross the placenta and cross into breast milk. Um, and then you would need to have barrier contraceptives when you take this. When we say barrier contraceptives, we mean condoms because if you're taking this medicine and you're on the pill it, for women, um, it can decrease the effectiveness of it. So contraindications and cautions, again, um, the gold salts can be very toxic. So it's contraindicated in the presence of any known allergy to gold. And then there is a 
variety of adverse effects that are common with the use of gold salts. And we talked about those a couple slides back. So important drug to drug interactions, you would not want to give those medications with penicillamine, um, anti-malarial drugs, any cytotoxic drugs or immunosuppressive agents. We have our DMARDs. Our DMARDs are our disease modifying anti-rheumatic drugs. Um, we give these drugs to patients who will have what we consider moderate to severe arthritis, or you can either um, give them to patients that have certain um, immune conditions. These drugs work to alter the disease process because they alter the patient's immune response. They either slow or block the inflammation depending on the medication and the damage that occurs with certain um, chronic inflammatory states. They can be associated with serious or potential fatal infections to the patients. Um, if they're used early in the disease process, it's possible that they can work to prevent and slow down the damage that are caused to the joints. These drugs are used when patients do not respond to the conventional therapy and are used to directly decrease the pain in the joints that are affected by arthritis. Arthritis is very, very painful to patients. It can be very debilitating. It can affect their lifestyle, their ADLs. It can be very hard for them to do the littlest things like opening up jars, writing with a pencil, get anything that needs that, um, you know, those fine motor skills, it can be very hard. Um, they alter the course of the inflammatory response and many rheumatologists um, use methotrexate. That is like the gold standard of these DMARDs, methotrexate. I'm sure you guys have seen um, commercials for this medication. Yes. Relina got kicked out. Okay, thank you. Um, so these drugs, so we have anakinra, which is a new, relatively new anti-arthritis drug. Um, um, Anakinra is an interleukin-1 receptor antagonist, so it blocks um, the interleukin-1, which is responsible for um, the degradation of that cartilage in rheumatoid arthritis. So they actually get this medication. It's given by a subcutaneous injection. And it's often used not by itself, but with other, a combination of other anti-arthritis um, drugs. So you would never seen this given by itself. And it's absorbed slowly from the subcutaneous tissue. It is metabolized in our tissue and it's excreted in the urine. So this would be a good medication for your patients that have liver issues. Um, you have Enterocept 1. This helps to reduce the signs and symptoms and in turn improve the function that our patients have with rheumatoid arthritis. It is genetically engineered um, and it helps keep the anti keeps that inflammatory response in check. And then you have your flonophamide, which is absorbed from the GI tract and it reaches peak hours in six to 12, peak levels in six to 12 hours. I've actually never given any of these drugs. The only ones that I've ever given in the hospital is the methotrexate. So these drugs are designed to provide relief to our patients um, for the signs and symptoms associated with rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis. It is, um, they are prescribed for the relief of mild to moderate pain. Um, it can serve as a, um, treatment of primary dysmenorrhea, and it also helps to reduce fevers. Um, let's see. So nursing considerations for patients receiving anti-arthritis agents, they are similar to those receiving NSAIDs and those related drugs, so all those same side effects. So now we're gonna talk about vaccines. So we have our biologicals. Biological um, 
vaccines, immune sera, antivenin and antitoxins are used to stimulate the response of antibodies. We use these words interchangeably. Um, they're used to provide preformed antibodies to help facilitate that immune reaction in the body. Um, they are designed to react with um, specific toxins produced by invading pathogens um, or venins, which are injected by poisonous snakes or spiders. They stimulate the production of antibodies to specific antigens with vaccines, and it provides the person with an immunity to that antigen so that when it recognizes it again, it'll be able to fight it off. So these are your flu vaccines, your COVID-19 vaccines. So this is an important slide. Come here. Um, we have two types of immunity. So we have our active immunity, which is where um, the body recognizes a foreign protein and it begins producing antibodies to react with it. This occurs when the body recognizes a foreign protein, um, produces those antibodies, causes a reaction with certain proteins or antigens. After it forms those plasma cells to produce those antibodies, then those specific memory cells produce those um, same antibodies. They're created so that when that antigen or that protein is um, introduced into the body again, those memory cells recognize it immediately, go right into action and release those antibodies to fight it off. So we have passive immunity. This occurs when the preformed antibodies are injected into the system and react with a specific antigen. Those circulating antibodies act in the same manner and they produce um, the same symptoms from the plasma cell. They recognize that foreign body, they attach to it and they render it harmless. The difference between the passive immunity and the active immunity is that passive immunity is limited. You guys need to know that. It only lasts as long as the circulating antibodies last um, and the body does not produce it on, does not produce its own antibodies. Passive immunity is limited. Active immunity is long lasting. Okay, you guys need to know that. So what is an immunization? Immunization is basically the process of artificially stimulating that active immunity in our body by exposing the body um, to a weakened or a less toxic protein associated with those specific disease causing organisms. The goal in immunization is to cause an immune response in the body without having the patient suffer the full course of the disease. So our childhood vaccines that we see in children, this is gonna be your, um, your diphtheria, your pertussis, your tetanus, your hemophilus B, you have hematitis B, hepatitis A, chicken pox, polio, measles, mumps, and rubella. These are your typic child, typical childhood vaccines. They stimulate an active immunity in people who are at risk. Um, so stimulating the productions of those antibodies to certain antigens um, with vaccines provides children and adults immunity to that antigen. We frequently call vaccines immunization because they stimulate immunity. They're used interchangeably. The vaccines that are needed depends on the person the exposure the person will have to certain pathogens. For example, nurses are subjected to hepatitis B, due, hepatitis B due to the frequent exposure to blood. So we definitely need to have a hepatitis B vaccine because of the exposure um, that we have. We're at a greater exposure to that. Um, some people that work in an office probably don't need to have the hepatitis B. So the different vaccines that we need depend on the exposure the person will have to the pathogens. That's important for you guys to know. Vaccines are thought to provide lifelong immunity. We do see though, however, especially with the chickenpox vaccine that we don't always get lifetime immunity. Um, 
there were a couple of you that had to have titers drawn to get into this program. And when you did, some people had to be revaccinated for certain things um, because they didn't show immunity to them anymore. I, that happened to me when I went in the nursing program. I had chicken pox when I was little, um, but I didn't have any immunity to them when I drew my titer. So I had to get the varicella vaccine. That's why we draw those titers to see what we still have immunity to and what we don't. So the use of vaccines is always gonna be contraindicated in the presence of immune deficiency because the vaccine could cause the disease and then the body would not be able to respond as anticipated because it was in that immunocompromised state. Um, we don't decide that, that's usually decided by the doctor. It's just something for you guys to think about. Um, so my example there is if you have a patient who's getting chemotherapy and they want to give your patient a certain, um, a certain immunization and they're neutropenic and they don't have any white blood cell count, probably not the best time to have that done. You would want to say, hmm, that's, this isn't a good time. Let me call the doctor, let them know what's going on with the patient. Maybe she wants to revisit this a couple months down the road when the patient's um, immune system is better. Um, Sometimes during pregnancy, we don't recommend it because of the different effects it can have on the fetus and actually um, maintaining the pregnancy itself. In patients with any known allergies to any components of certain vaccines, it would be contraindicated. Patients who are receiving immunoglobulin or have received blood or blood, can, blood products in the last three months, um, you wanna use these carefully because they can cause a serious immune reaction to occur. We always want to take caution um, to use to be used anytime a vaccine is given to a child with a history of febrile convulsions or any kind of cerebral injury um, where a, a potential fever would be dangerous because we know these vaccines can cause fevers sometimes um, and they can also cause um, make acute infections worse. So um, if you, if you have a child that comes into the clinic, if you're working in a pediatric clinic and you know mom's there to give her baby their one year vaccines and the mom said, you ask the patient, has the, how's the child been? Has she been sick? Does she have any cold? And the mom says, oh yeah, she has a cold right now. She's got a runny nose and a cough and a fever. Then you would not wanna give those immunizations you would educate with the mom that we have to wait till the symptoms are resolved and that she can reschedule her, reschedule her appointment for a later date. Important information there. You guys are gonna see that again. So what are some adverse side effects of vaccines? Well, you could have a fever because not that they're getting the actual live virus, but because our immune system is mounting a response. So this is where teaching comes into play with our patients. I can't tell you how many times even my own family members have said, I'm not getting the flu vaccine. It gives me the flu. No, it doesn't give you the flu. It allows your immune system to mount a response. When our immune system is mounting a response, these are the side effects that we see because we know our, our immune system is busy at work, recognizing those um, bacteria, mounting that response, creating those memory cells so that when we see it again, it can fight it off. That's how we know it's working. So we might have a fever. We could get a rash. I got a rash when I got my um, COVID-19 vaccine. I didn't with the first one, but a day after my second one, and it lasted for about nine days. I had a huge lump in there and a rash right around the area. Body aches, you can get body aches from certain um, vaccines. You can get chills, drowsiness, um, anorexia, maybe even vomiting, and then of course, irritability. Um, these are some of the things you can see. It is very, very common to get pain, redness, and swelling at the injection site. When you give your patient a vaccine, that is the main thing you're going to educate them about. Mrs. Jones, I'm going to give you your flu vaccine today. You're going to hand them that piece of paper that you print out that tells them all the adverse side effects because you can't go over everything. And you're going to say, I want you to know that you are, it is a possibility that you might in you might experience pain, redness, and swelling at the injection site. Important information there, guys. This is a um, slide that you guys, you can look in your book. It talks about the cell, how it gets invaded, cellular injury, releasing that histamine, um, all those 
um, proteins being released, the plasma cells forming those antibodies. You can look at that in your book if you want to see more. So immune sera. Sera is usually used to refer to sera that contain antibodies to specific bacteria or viruses. The term antitoxin refers to immune sera that have antibodies to very specific toxins that might be released by certain invading pathogens. The term antivenom, venin, is used to refer to immune sera that have antibodies to venom that might be injected through spiders or snake bites. These drugs are used to provide early treatment following exposure to certain, of certain known antigens. They're very specific for antigens to which they can respond. So immune sera. This would be considered. Oh God, that scared me. Go ahead, Ryan. And this this was the serum here form of passive immunity, correct? Any kind of serum. Active immunity. Well, or passive. Or passive. It depends on what it is. Yes. Um, so, well, the immune sera, they provide that passive immunity um, to specific antigens, not the active immunity. Um, and in that case, it could be a pathogen, a venom, or a toxin. These are also used as prophylaxis against specific diseases after exposure um, in which you would find patients that are immunosuppressed. And then they may also be used to lessen the severity of a disease after they've, a patient has a known or a suspected exposure to something. So the immune sera is to provide passive immunity, to answer your question, Ryan, not active. OK, thank you. Yep. So contradictions to immune sera and antitoxins. So we would not want to use um, in a patient that has a history of a severe reaction to any immune sera or to products that are similar to the components of the sera um, because we wanna prevent those potential hypersensitivity reactions. They should be used with caution during pregnancy because they do cause certain risks to the fetus. We wanna use cautiously in patients with coagulation defects or if they have a history or current um, history of thrombocytopenia, or in patients with a known history of a previous exposure to that immune sera because they are then increased risk, they are at an increased risk for a hypersensitivity reaction that can occur each time they use it. So the reaction, um, the possibility of having another reaction or a severe reaction increases each time they are um, come in contact with it. Some of the side effects that or adverse reactions that you might see are rash, nausea, vomiting, chills and fever. Your allergic reactions are more gonna look like that chest tightness, feel like their throat is closing, their blood pressure is gonna drop, they can have difficulty breathing. Your local reactions are gonna be swelling at the site, tenderness, pain. Um, you can have muscle stiffness at that injection site. That's also very, very common. So biological weapons um, in box 18.4, chapter 18, you can read about this. We know that certain viruses can be used um, or vaccines can be used as a biological weapon. We know anthrax um, came out back in 1998. We know the plague from many, 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 many years ago. You have smallpox. And then now, you know, depending on who you talk to, you could include COVID in this as well, because a lot of people think that this was created um, to hurt people. And then this talks more. You had the viral hemorrhagic fever, botulism, tularemia. You guys can read about this in your book. So this is an important slide you guys need to know 
um, administration guidelines for vaccines. There's a lot of vaccines on here. Um, you should know who should get them and who shouldn't get them and then how many doses you should give. So when would you give a patient the flu vaccine? How long is the fact, I'm just using this as an example. Um, how long is it good for? Who should get the pneumonia shot? How many shots should they get? So I want you to know this. Um, look at this chart and know that you could have some questions on your exam. Okay.